Good afternoon everybody, Mike Winkler here. This is officially the first video to have a third iteration, right? We've been doing this roughly five years and Qradar's core architecture hasn't changed all that much. But what has is kind of the ways we can use it and the ways that you folks want to tend to use it. So um, let's go through, let's get dirty in this about the different ways we can use our old friend Qradar. Okay, there is at core a Qradar all-in-one. Um, it runs up to those numbers and 15,000 events per second. That's a lot. And most of the time, uh, that's all you need. A lot of medium businesses, that's all you need. It runs one box. What this means, though, is it's the user interface. It hosts all the apps you need. It's all the log events. It's all the net flows. This includes the collection of the data, the processing of the data, and the... Um, the, the presenting it of it to you, right? So everything is done on one box. Everything comes out in one place. And a lot of medium businesses, this is all they really need. Okay, so let's talk about how this is different. There is a lot of use of hybrid clouds, multi-clouds, whatever word we're settling on here. So that in these, um, in these stores, I have QRadar sitting OS and application in a single image. So you don't need to mess around with that and it's native to each marketplace, right? So if you wanna run this in Google Cloud, you just pull down the latest Qradar image and it's there for you. Now, some of the, the coming attractions here, right? Some of the stuff that we don't have yet is gonna use Ansible playbooks and OpenShift, right? Some of these fun things coming out of Red Hat. So what we're getting here is um, spontaneously generating an image that's got the newest patches and the newest configurations, or even if you blow something up, it rebuilds it based on your config file from scratch. So we have images in all of these stores now, but we're heading to a place where we won't need to. Okay, moving away from that all-in-one, there is the Qradar Distributed. This is where I have a single console that'll run as many event or flow processors as you want. Okay, great. So what this means is even the largest networks in the world, two or three million events per second, or one extreme case at seven million, um, I can run any number of event processors under one console. We can say this is for true because we're doing it, right? The biggest networks in the world are running this way. I can have event an event processor or any number of these. Each one will process up to 80,000 events per second, which is a lot. What process means in this case is it collects the logs, it normalizes the data, it runs the rules, and it reports up to that distributed console, okay? The console will keep indexes of everything that's going on so the data can be retrieved quickly. There is a flow processor that is the equal to the event processor. It collects up to 3.6 million flows per minute, right? Which is a big size number. I can have as many of these as we want and it does like I was saying is it normalizes, it collects, it runs the rules, it kicks information up to that distributed console, which creates indexes so the data is available quickly. Okay? There is a combined processor, which is kind of an odd unit at this point, for times where you want event and flow processing um, that isn't a great deal of each, but you need some of both. Okay. So my Qradar console generates that user interface. All of the logs go to the event processor. All of the flows go to the flow processor. Looks pretty similar to that last drawing, except for the fact we split it into separate boxes, okay? Um, and this is the core of distributed architecture. Now, let's say we want, we've got some big things going on. Let's say we've got um, some different ways we're looking at our data. I always want to keep the event and the flow processors as physically close together as we can. It's not always an option, but anytime you can, you should. So regardless of what my geography or my architecture is, I always want to keep those together. And we'll talk in just a minute about how we collect from remote sites. Okay, but this is the best use of essentially bandwidth and machine power. Years ago, we used to run these separately. Um, but now there's so much communication back and forth between the event and the flow processor and the console is it's always best to keep them as close together as you can. Okay. So let's take a look at that event processor a little bit. I can send logs directly to it like we've been talking about. I can also have a log collector or an event collector, excuse me. Um, it is worthy of note that in QRock, this is called a data gateway, but it is exactly the same thing or functionally the same thing. 
I can send log events to that event collector remotely, right? So that if I have logs that are off in the distance, I can press and encrypt them and send them on to the event processor. And this has turned out to be the best use of bandwidth and hardware resources to get the performance you need. Um, I can have as many event collectors as I want. So if you have a really distributed environment, but that's pretty active remotely, is I can put um, event collectors out to collect that remote data up to some good size numbers and still keep my processors close to my console, right? So it is worthy to note you get roughly 10 to one compression and you get encryption. So all of your data is secured as well as um, compressed to make best use of that all expensive bandwidth. Okay, so let's throw these concepts together. I have my um, event processor, my flow processor, and my console, and I have event collectors. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna set, in this case, them in Oregon, right? So my event and flow processor, my console, there they are. Um, but I wanna collect data all across the country. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna set these event collectors in Michigan, Texas, and I guess Key West, so that they will compress and encrypt the data and they will send it back to my home office in Oregon, right? So that we can do this to any scale in the world. Also, if I've got an AWS instance or an Azure instance or anything else, I wanna put the console, the processors close together and then set collectors in different zones so you're paying the minimum amount of transfer cost between zones and you get the best use of that hardware, even if it's virtual hardware. Okay, um, past that. I have things we can add on here, right? That's the basic architecture, but let's look at talk about a couple of the add-on components now. I have data nodes. Sometimes you will want more storage at high speed than you can get out of an event processor. My boxes by default have 70 terabytes of space, 56 usable by the application. Um, I have folks running them out to 100 terabytes per box at this point. Those are very big boxes. But let's say you need more than that. I'm running 40,000 events per second and I need two years of storage, right? It's gonna be more data than that. So I can take a data node, an identical piece of hardware, right? That I can put it behind that event processor so that I will have um, doubling the processors, the storage, the RAM, the whole bit, so that at the same speed I was looking at 56 terabytes, I can now look at 156 or 250 terabytes of space at the same retrieval speed. Um, this, is, um, this is for the large customers or for people that need long periods of long retention, and in the same way I can put this on hardware, I can put this on instances. But we have a certain number of folks that are using this because they need large volumes of data at good speeds. Okay, there is something called data stores. Um, it is a license that fits on an event processor and possibly a data node, right? Data stores, data node, don't mean to be complicated here. What data stores is, it's just a license. It allows you to use all of the unused capacity of that event processor and that data node to collect non-security logs. So if I've got 20,000 events per second, going to an event processor that's rated to 40,000, I can use the other 20,000 to pull in all of these logs that aren't security centric, so that if I wanna do forensics, I can do lookups. And also I've got it all in one place for look and feel. Thus, um, what we call a cupcake model is an event processor, a data node, and a data stores instance. So I get um, 150 terabytes of searchable speed at good, full speed because of all the processing and RAM on this, I will use half of that for my security events so I never run out of capacity, and the other half for non-security events so I can search them um, in correlation to the same searches and through the same interface, right? So that's a cupcake, which is both data nodes and data stores. Okay, um, getting past that, there is an app host. What an app host is, is additional um, resource speed, resource space mostly RAM, right, but it does some other things, so that you can run more apps on your QRadar console. One of the limitations of the underlying Red Hat to QRadar, what Docker will do, right, and to remind you, Docker is the space that you run your apps in that is separated so if an app crashes, it won't hurt the major application. So that I can run up to 10% of the memory on a device in Docker. Okay, fair enough. 
Um, but if I want to run more than that 12.8 gigs, I can create an app host and all of those apps will migrate off to the app host. So if I'm running user behavioral analytics or DNS analytics or Pulse or Watson or one of these big users, I can migrate them off to an app host so to take the pressure off my console. Okay, moving past that. A flow processor, and this is very parallel to the event processor, so this should look very similar to you. I can set out a flow collector. It'll take up to 10,000 flows, to, excuse me, 10 million flows per minute, which is a very large number, right? And I will send that back to a flow processor. So I can gather flows either directly or through a flow collector, right? And extending our logic, if I have my home office in Seattle and I want to, have to collect flows from Dallas, from Michigan, and from Key West, I can put flow collectors out there as well. Okay. So uh, one of the thought for you before we go, because that is QRadar architecture for 2020. There's some little things and some add-ons I didn't get into because that would have made this a, a two-hour video and it wouldn't have been valuable to most people. But I want to take a minute here and I want to talk about QRock. Okay, QRadar on cloud or the IBM hosted version of this and talk about how it works with this architecture, right? So if we go through and we take QRock and... Um, I have any number of data gateways. And I mentioned there's an event processor and a flow processor. If you put them together, they become essentially a data gateway. So it is everything an event and a flow collector does. It compresses and encrypts the data, okay? And I can gather these from anywhere and you can have roughly however many you want that attach to your Qflow. There may be a contract thing. We need to make sure you're licensed for that many, but technically you can have as many as you want. So I can have a plant in Chicago that I put a data gateway at, right? All well and good. And then maybe another one at the Chicago office and then one at the Dallas office, right? So that, you know, any place I have these, I will put down these data gateways. They compress, they encrypt, they send it up to QRock. You don't worry about event processors or flow processors or consoles or anything. It's all taken care of automatically. That's what you're paying my guys for. This works the same way if you're talking about AWS zones as well. I lay out as many of them as you want, and let's throw in an Azure just to be crazy with this, right? The big value of QRock is IBM handles everything. Guys, thank you for your time on this. I am Mike Winkler, and this has been a walkthrough of the QRadar architecture for 2020.